Uh, well, thank you, and thanks for these talks, and <clears throat> I've learned so much today. I want to be clear, I didn't, uh, it was David Feinberg, from, who's now at Google, who said that uh, child psychiatrists are fully trained psychiatrists, so I don't want to claim credit for that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking today about work I'm doing in early um, childhood mental health, so this is kids under the age of six. So I'm going to start with a story. So these are my twins um, who are now in college, but they've given me permission to uh, show this picture of them. And um, I love this picture because I feel like it captures the children um, who my work is focused on. And so I'm going to tell a story when they were four years old and we were at one of those hellish soccer uh, games for preschoolers. Maybe others enjoyed them more than I did. But um, there was one little boy who was acting like a beast. He was kicking the other children. He lay on the field. He was climbing the goalposts. And his father was yelling at him and the coach was yelling at him. When we got in the car to go home, Leo said, Mommy, everybody thinks that he's a bad boy, but he's really a sad boy. And that that story really represents um, the work that I'm trying to do, which is how do we see what that child was able to see in, in this other child's emotional experience? How can we get access to that um, in a way that is scalable? Now, my early work, I'm an epidemiologist, so sort of the first 10, 20 years of my work was on the developmental epidemiology of preschool mental health problems. Turns out that <clears throat> one in nine uh, preschool children, two to five, has an impairing mental health disorder with a, rate, with a rate that's similar to older kids, and only about 15% ever get any kind of mental health care. And the issue is that our current approaches just don't scale. And the key thing is you can, obviously must use parent report. It's part of an assessment, but it is not sufficient to assess a child. You must do observational assessment. And of course, the challenges with preschoolers are that they don't have the language, you can't have them do a rating scale or do a structured interview. So the lab that I lead now at NYU is called the Wonder Lab, and it is a digital health initiative where we're bringing together child mental health, digital technology, and data science to try to create new methods and generate new knowledge that will be transformative in the science and practice of early childhood mental health. And what I want, I'm not gonna go into details about this, but I think our approach is um, somewhat different than some of the other academic med medical digital health um, programs, because we make things. So, and this was um, really started when I was at Duke, where I was for 20 years. When I left Duke, I was co-leading with an engineer an initiative called the Child Mental Health, um, Child Mental Health and Information Initiative, and I think I was probably the only child psychiatrist. I was 50% time over in the engineering school and had an office there. But what emerged from that is the need not just to pass things back and forth or to collaborate, but to work hand in hand with people from different disciplines to create digital tools that are gonna be useful. So in the Wonder Lab, we have a flat team that involves scientists, clinicians, um, we have a bioethicist on our team, but also our digital designers, our UX designer, a digital strategist, and we create, co-create tools together uh, using human-centered design and agile development. We also use very rigorous user testing. I'll give you an example. The other thing is we make things, we build things to scale, and number three, because this is just what I'm passionate about right now, we make consumer-facing tools. There's so many barriers to recognizing early childhood mental health that I feel that we have to give parents direct access to evidence-based knowledge about their kids so that they can advocate um, and get the help that they need. So I'm gonna give you two examples of work we've done. And I just wanna emphasize this, this has been raised a number of times, but what is human-centered design? And I love this definition, it's a process that starts with the people you're designing for and ends with new solutions that are tailor-made to suit their needs. So any, all of us who are doctors out there, you know, the, the patient failed the treatment, 
<laughs> we, we have in our very language. So if your tool doesn't work and people don't want to use it, it's not that your user failed. You failed to create something that met the needs of the population you were trying to serve. So the work that we did at um, first at Duke was uh, resulted in a, a research kit app called Autism and Beyond. And here we were trying to solve for the question, can we make digital tools that will use computer vision algorithms to automatically code a child's behavior and emotions? Now, it would be necessary for scaling. And so we first started with iPads in a primary care clinic, but the child watched videos, videos that we had used in our uh, research labs that are designed to elicit social emotional responses. They watched um, on the device and then we used the front facing camera to record a video of the child watching the stimulus. We then used software and developed software to um, automatically detect the emotions in real time. This is one of our graduate student kids. One thing I want to say here, um, because we're the child perspective, we need to have developmentally sensitive algorithms. So it's not just that we have adult algorithms and child algorithms. Algorithms for early childhood mental health are going to be very different than for middle uh, school age kids and older kids. So we did a study where parents could access um, the Autism and Beyond app from the App Store. Over the course of the study, we had um, almost 1,800 parents participate. Kids were 12 to 72 months. We collected over you know, 5,600 caregiver reports, but most importantly, from my perspective and feasibility, we collected um, over 4,000 videos of children in their home. And really the question is, okay, you did that, but what's the quality? 87% of the frames of these videos that parents collected with very brief descriptions on the phone were usable for doing our computer vision algorithms. And I'm just gonna show you, this is a actual, uh, one of the videos that we collected. There's the emotions, but on the bottom left and right, that's actually head motion. So if you see here, you'll see how we can combine head motion with, um, with emotion. So in a second, there's gonna be happy, and then the child will turn, and then turn back. And that actually is something we call social referencing. That was looking, there was a hopping bunny. So mommy, look at the bunny. Um, and that's something that children with autism do less commonly than children who do not have autism. Now turning uh, in this flying through to uh, the current work we're doing, and so we are building an early childhood mental health di digital platform that's called When to Wonder, and our first um, application app-based study is called When to Wonder Picky Eating. That picture is actually our lab, so um, in the department. Again, you have to create a space where it's, you can have a flat, non-hierarchical team, which is pretty, challenging in an academic medical center to be able to do the kind of divergent and convergent uh, work that needs to be done to create tools like this. So When to Wonder is a scalable digital platform with a variety multimodal task, that's the key thing in terms of the assessment, from multiple informants to quantify the full range of kids' um, mental health and development for screening, giving parents access to knowledge, actionable advice, and for us to create new information. Now, what we'll see on the other side, it's what I call the when to worry domains. So rather than entering into apps for preschoolers, most people don't ask, think, ah, is my three-year-old depressed? They say, my three-year-old's a picky eater. She'll only eat white food. Oh my God, my son got kicked out of preschool because he, he had a tantrum and bit another child. That's the entry point. These are those kind of domains. And so really coming from my epidemiology perspective, there is a distribution, a normative distribution. And then at the top 15, 12%, a clinically significant presentation. What I like about this approach is even if it's typical, first of all, that's reassuring, but then you're like, what the heck am I gonna do? You still gives us an opportunity to give advice and insights personalized back to parents about how to manage these behaviors. But of course, for the children where there's clinically significant presentation, the goal is to be able to get um, 
get kids the help they need. So I'm going to conclude, and if the um, AV folks could switch over, I'm actually going to show you um, the app. So this is uh, when to wonder picky eating. So I'm going to show you an example of a task that we created that is a fun task that children enjoy, but is actually created to collect in a succinct way, digitally in the home, multiple levels of um, information about, directly from a young child. So we created this yummy yucky game, which we jokingly call the Tinder for cauliflower. And so it's a sorting game where you can hit the little guys or you can sort them back and forth. You remember these are kids who can't read. One thing I want to emphasize when we think about user-centered design is the importance of beauty and delight. So when we were designing it initially, it, these, the, the pictures were on an arc that didn't move and I was like, no, well, that's not fun. It's got to like bounce. It's got to be like, you can fling it one way or the other. You want to be able to interact in a joyful kind of way. So the child um, completes that. We did user testing. Initially, we thought kids could sort maybe 10 foods, and then they'd have to do a mini game. Turns out in user testing, kids 4 to 7 can sort 160 foods in 7 to 10 minutes, <laughs> <laughs> which was good from a feasibility point of view. Then um, you get information on your child's yums and yucks, but then the parent also completes the game about his or her child, and then we're able to give information on how you match or you don't match with your child. Again, this is a study, but then we're going to be able to use those to drill down and even have conversations um, with kids. Um, I can go into different things. We are doing the video as well. We have questionnaires um, and then we'll feedback that's based on your results. And that's another design principle I really want to emphasize. People are talking about things that are very upsetting and painful and people feel ashamed. And I do feel that we have to leverage behavioral economics, but I think in the way of saying, we're actually going to give you everything you put in here, we're going to give you something back that's going to enhance your capacity to support your child's healthy development. And I think that's a key part of being able to develop these kind of relationships through digital tools. So if we could go back, um, and I will conclude. So there we go. Even like our blinky guy, I mean, there are little things you can do to make it feel a little more engaging. So um, you know, there's a lot more to talk about, but um, thank you for the opportunity to present examples of what we're doing. Of course, this work has so many different collaborators from so many different groups and expertise, um, and most importantly, the families um, who uh, enable us to create these tools. And then lastly, the study is still up, so if you have children who are two to seven, um, it's both iOS and Android. Um, uh, encourage folks to download the app and enroll in the study, and um, I'll tell you a trick. If you wanna play with it, put your real age in, and we'll know to exclude you <laughs> from our, our final data set. So. <laughs> Thank you so much.